Hello, I'm Dr. Anna Dale. In this video, I will go over the main content of what I am calling Part 1 of Plato's Apology. In this part of the dialogue, Socrates introduces himself to the jury to begin his speech in his own defense, and he provides his defense against the early accusers, the first of the two set of accusers he says he faces. In introducing himself, Socrates denies that he will deceive the jury by using fancy rhetoric, and this is one of the charges against him. He claims that he will merely speak the truth, and he asks the jury to not be offended if he uses a crude form of speech, the kind of speech that he is accustomed to use in the marketplace, talking to anybody who will listen. Socrates then tells the jury that he faces two sets of accusers. The first set of accusers are the fathers and teachers of the jurymen. They have spent decades telling stories about Socrates and how he is a troublemaker, how he investigates natural phenomena, and how he makes weak arguments defeat strong arguments. Notice that these are the occupations of the natural philosophers who study the earth and the stars, and the sophists who make weak arguments win. So, uh, Socrates when raising this issue of the early accusers, is indirectly pointing out the issue of bias on the part of the jurors. He's pointing out to them that all of them come with a set of quite strong beliefs that they have been instructed in by their teachers and fathers about Socrates, who makes trouble and who does all sorts of things. So he's uh, appealing indirectly to their knowledge of his reputation in court and how this might bias their judgment against him. Look for Socrates' evidence that he gives against both of these charges. How does he defend himself against the charge that he investigates the physical world? And how does he defend himself against the charge that he teaches unethical argument tactics? A hint for the second one is the question of payment, being paid for teaching. So look carefully for the evidence Socrates provides on both of those counts. Then Socrates offers uh, the sort of example or comparison that many Athenians found offensive. He asks Callias where he would take his sons to be trained if they were colts or calves. Here Socrates is mocking the sophists and people who paid for their lessons. He is suggesting that they treat their students like livestock and not like free and intellectual human beings. In contrasting himself to the sophists, Socrates also claims to possess no wisdom or at least only human wisdom, he says, not the seemingly supernatural or godly wisdom that the sophists claim to have and to sell. And then we have the story of the oracle in the last section of this part. Pay careful attention to this story and its details, as Socrates uses it to give the justification for his life of philosophizing despite popular opposition. Here are some important points to note in the oracle story. First, Socrates himself does not go to the oracle, because that would be hubris. His friend goes, without his knowledge, and asks, is anyone wiser than Socrates? Okay, second point, the oracle's response is not, Socrates is the wisest. Instead, she says, no one is wiser. And there is a significant difference here. Socrates is not being singled out as, as superior to all other Athenians or all other Greeks, but the god does tell us that there is no one who is superior to Socrates. So we'll think about that for a little bit. Third, Socrates' reaction to the oracle's message is very important. He does not just accept her word for it uncritically, but he puts it to the test. And in testing it, he annoys his fellow, with fellow citizens, and he makes himself very unpopular. But finally, Socrates comes to understand her meaning more deeply. Interpreting the answer, no one is wiser, turns out to be a lesson about the true value of human wisdom, says Socrates. Lastly, Socrates attracted a following among the young men of Athens as he publicly questioned various authority figures in the city. And this is one reason he was accused of being a sophist, his large following among the youth. Part one ends with Socrates turning to the later accusers, the ones who are present in court that day, prosecuting him. These are Anitus, Lycon, and Miletus. We'll talk about part two next. Goodbye.